Welcome to another edition of the Camel Clutch Blog Extra, where we take a look at the hot topics this week in professional wrestling. And as always, I am joined by my favorite co-host. He is the host himself of Between the Ropes and a writer for Fox Sports and SportingNews.com, respectively, Brian Fritz. Brian, welcome back. I'm just glad that I'm now the favorite. I like that tag. Well, you know, it was either you or nobody else. But, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but you're still the favorite. A lot of competition out there. A lot of competition out there. A lot of competition out there. But, uh, but no, I mean, you and I have been doing this uh, since the late 90s and always a, a good time sitting down and talking with you. Um, but, yes, yeah, so, Brian, it is a big week. It is uh, Survivor Series week, but a, a story that has evolved – uh, into a much bigger story is this whole WWE Divas contract signing angle that went down on Monday Night Raw with Charlotte and Paige. Now, originally, when I wrote a blog about this uh, Tuesday, the morning after, um, I wasn't offended by it. Uh, a lot of people were. A lot of people called it tasteless. A lot of people called it disgusting. A lot of people were offended. I wasn't offended by it because at the time – I made a lot of presumptions, and my presumption was if it's okay with Charlotte and it's okay with the rest of the Flair family, then it's okay by me because who am I to get offended over something like that? And everybody deals with grief differently. Um, I've I've also lost a brother in recent years, so I certainly have a lot of empathy and sympathy for what Charlotte is going through, and people deal with uh, grief differently. So – my original take was, you know what, um, not only was it just not a good angle, I didn't think it was a very productive angle in, in selling the match, but I wasn't offended by it. But now we're talking two days later, and Ric Flair went on his podcast, and he said he was never notified about it. Uh, he was very hesitant to come out outright and criticize it, but uh, the way that he described it on his podcast, he said that Charlotte's in a position where she's afraid to say no, um, and uh, he cried. Rick cried. Nobody told him about it. Nobody even called him afterwards to check on him and to see if it was okay. And then on top of that, making matters even even uh, worse or just unraveling this mystery even more, there is a report uh, from Brandon Stroud on Uprox that says that Charlotte was the one that pitched the idea to the writer. So a couple of different elements here, Brian, I'd like to, to get your thoughts on one. Um, Rick is saying on his podcast uh, that nobody's contacted him uh, before or after. Number two, he's on his podcast saying that Charlotte couldn't say no. So either one of two things is happening. Either Uprox has it wrong or Charlotte had this idea and she hasn't even contacted him yet to talk about it. And just your thoughts on the angle itself. Well, it's funny because I saw that thing from Brandon, and then I know Mike Johnson at PW Insider has refuted that and had said, no, it wasn't Charlotte's idea. It was one that got pitched to her, and she had said, okay, I'll do it. But, you know, like you mentioned and Rick had said on his podcast, it was something that she just can't refuse right now considering her position in the company. Right. Uh, when I saw the angle, I was very, very uncomfortable, and – I'm okay with some edgy storylines, and, and I think that wrestling is better when they do that, but I think it has to deal with that person right there. I don't, I don't like it too much when it delves too much into family like kids, or especially yeah. when it comes to somebody that's already passed. You know, um, That's why I even like go back to the storyline they did you know, 10 years ago with Rey Mysterio um, and Eddie Guerrero yes. after Eddie had passed away. That was very uncomfortable. So – that was one of the problems I had with it was they were bringing up this storyline of, you know, Reed passing. And I just thought it was unnecessary. I thought it was something that was done very cheap and salacious and done just to try to get people talking and not for the right reasons. It didn't get the right kind of heat. Plus, on top of that, if you look at the state of WWE right now and they'll sit there and they'll say this is sports entertainment. It's not anything that's different from a drama or a soap opera. That's out there, but at the same time, they're trying to promote family-friendly product and PG-rated content, and it totally goes against that. What was really strange, too, is on a night where WWE showed a lot of class with the moment of silence to open yes. up the show for the you know, victims in Paris, and then later on, while they didn't show the video package for the passing of Bob Backlund, the announcers did talk about it. Uh, Bob so, Backlund? Whoa! I mean, not, excuse me, not Bob, Nick Bockwinkle, <laughs> excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry about that, uh, Mr. Backlund. Yeah. Uh, but 
you know, they, they, they talk about the passing and, you know, what a great gentleman, a great champion he was. And then they close the show with a, a very edgy, controversial angle like this. It just seems so out of place. Yeah. You know, um, I don't want to be a hypocrite because I've gone on your podcast and when you and I had a real lengthy discussion about what needs to change when, when they had low ratings, um, my point of view was that they needed more edginess. They need to be more edgy, kind of like the Attitude Era, but not quite – Um, and this certainly was edgy and I don't mind edgy, um, especially in the PG 13 in the PG era. I I think it's, um, welcome. I just, you know, I look at the angle and I watch the angle just like everybody else did. And I just didn't see the purpose. If you could, if you, meaning a WWE writer, uh, somebody in charge of creative could pitch me why they needed to do that and what the objective was, then maybe I would understand it better. But you know, for starters, for the casual audience watching at home, and I mean casual audience such as like, you know, kids. I mean, my nieces watch watch Raw and they're, they're kids. Um, that's the, the casual audience at home. They know nothing about Reed Flair. Now, sure, they'll go on Google the next day or Wikipedia or whatever, but they know nothing about Reed Flair. So I don't really understand where they were going. And I think that if it was their idea um, – it's a really uh, it's 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 really uh, it's almost sick because, you know, you watch Rick and Charlotte talk about Reed and they're obviously still in a lot of pain. I was watching. I don't know if you saw the table for three recently that it had Charlotte and Tamina and Natalia on there and uh, Reed came up and Charlotte broke down. And, and quite honestly, I don't think she recovered throughout the entire table for three. She lost her place on Monday when she was talking about it. So obviously this girl is dealing with a lot of pain um, right now. And it almost, Brian, and, and, and I'm curious for your thoughts on this. You know, Charlotte said something during that promo where she said the only reason she's there is for Reed. And, you know, I mean, I might be reading way too much into this and going on the idea that it wasn't her idea. It's almost as if, if she's saying, um, I'm only doing this because, you know, for Reed, I'm not doing this for, for anybody else. And, um, almost like, like giving the finger, uh, you know, to the company, but I just don't even see what the objective was, Brian, and, in in what's it going to sell? Yeah, that's the whole thing too. You know, you're sitting going, does this going to, does this make you more interested in getting survivor series? Right. Does this make you more interested in the match that they have? And to me, no, um, <laughs> you know, I know WWE might even go as far as, well, we keep talking about this Divas revolution and you want more women. So what are you complaining about? Because we gave them an edgy storyline. People said they want more edgy content. We're giving you more of the women. We put them in the main event slot. But I I think there needs to be an addendum that goes with that from a standpoint of you can be edgy, but there needs to be a better purpose to it. And there's a difference between going over the line and jumping over the line and the other thing is, too, when it comes to the women, that's great. You want to do more with them. But, like, this came out of nowhere. I mean, they yeah. didn't even promote that this was in the main event slot. It's just they just kept promoting the contract signing was coming up. And as the show went on, you kept waiting for it. And then out of nowhere, it's it's 1045 on the East Coast. And they're coming back from break. And you're like, oh, wait, the contract signing is actually in the final segment of the show. Yeah. You know, which was really strange because you would think, like. That's where they're going to put the match be with Roman Reigns and Cesaro. But that was that was long gone. Yeah. And the only thing was weird about that. I mean, I was watching that match and it kind of hit me going, OK, are they doing the Del Rio Kalisto match on SmackDown? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I was kind of thinking the same thing. I was like, what's going on here, man? They still got that match to go. Yeah. And um, I guess they were just focused on, hey, let's let's focus on these first two hours and hopefully get a little bit of an overrun. And if we can keep people for a third hour, great. If not, the third hour has been tanking lately anyway. So it was just, I just thought that it was, you know, a little bit too much of everything, you know, that, okay, you want to be edgy, you want to be controversial, fine. But I thought this went a bit too far, especially from what has been their norm. And then the same thing with the women. It's just like, you want to do one more that fine, but I think you've got to gradually build and educate the audience rather than just, Throw it in there and assume it's going to be accepted and people are going to go crazy for it. Yeah, and I mean, it takes a, I gotta be honest, I mean, it takes a real sick person to even pitch this idea, whether it came from the top or somebody else, to, to know how 
um, uh, emotional she is about her brother and then to, to even just, just to have that idea, just to pitch the idea. I mean, I mean, it takes a, a really sick person, but you know, I, I want, I want to talk about just the whole aspect that nobody even contacted Ric Flair. Um, his ex-wife Beth, um, uh, posted a tweet, which obviously wasn't very complimentary. Um, and, and I mean, just the fact that, you know, on Rick's podcast, he mentioned two or three times that Stephanie, Michael Hayes, and Triple H have her back. He mentioned it like like two or three times he mentioned that, which I thought was kind of weird that he mentioned it so many times. And here's a guy we've heard about for, for so long that Hunter and Rick are supposed to be close. So obviously Hunter and Rick being so close, Stephanie and Rick are going to be close. They know about how much hurt this guy has for his son and for nobody to call this guy beforehand or even after, I mean, I know they're busy. They don't even have to call him. They could have somebody else call him. But but for nobody to, to, to contact him, um, I, I really think that's inexcusable. Yeah, and that's what's weird. And I mean, I know that they might have this mindset of, well, Rick knows it's the wrestling business, but this is something that's personal to him. This isn't just we're doing some kind of strange angle with your daughter. We're talking yeah. about your son. That's involved in this. We're talking about her brother. And you know? and let me cut you, let me cut you off for a second. It's 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 your daughter and your son because we're talking yep. about your son and your daughter who's having an obvious uh, obviously a hard time dealing with this is being put in that position. So it's both of your kids. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, you can try to explain it to Rick, and I think it's a weak explanation. I'm saying yeah. why we didn't tell him in advance. But when you're dealing with Elizabeth, who, yes, she was around the wrestling business because her. Her husband was in it, you know, but hell, you know, she wasn't in the business herself, you know, yeah. I mean, and then to have to go through this again, you know, when it comes to her son passing and being thrown out there on television to be exploited for a wrestling angle. I mean, and she's not even asked about it. I mean, what are they going to do? Ask her and she's going to say no. And they're going to be like, well, we're going to do it anyway. That might, yeah. that might have been their mentality saying, well, we're doing it anyway. We're not asking for permission. You yeah. know, we're just giving you a heads up. And if she had gotten a heads up, she might have gone public with it going, oh, wait till you see what they're going to do with my daughter tonight. And they're going to bring up my my dead son, uh -huh. you know. So but I mean, to me, it's still not excusable. Maybe that's another reason, you know, why they shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, uh, just just closing this segment out. Um, Rick on his podcast said that by the time they get to Survivor Series, it'll be water under the bridge. Um, but but I don't know. You know, it's um, it's one of these things. And and again, we have conflicting reports about whether it was Charlotte's idea or, or not. And if it was our idea, I mean, it's 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 a it's a completely different animal in in my opinion. But, you know, for somebody like Charlotte, who. You know, who obviously loves wrestling, but, you know, didn't have this burning desire to get into the wrestling business until she was there on that WrestleMania weekend. And then, of course, uh, the tragedy that, that struck her family, which inspired her to get into the business. I mean, you know, at some point, I have to wonder if she's just going to say enough's enough and, and walk because – you know, I don't know her. I've never met her, but she seems to be a pretty level-headed girl. Uh, people uh, ha that I do know um, have a lot of nice things to say about her. Um, and, and I just wonder if at one point she's just going to get up and say, you know what, this this just isn't for me. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see that. You know, I mean, I I don't know her, but I mean, I've met her on two different occasions and yeah. sat down and, and had conversations with her, you know, which have been for, you know, the website. And she's always been super pleasant, especially this past year at WrestleMania. I got to talk to her on the Friday before Mania, and we had a nice conversation even after the mm -hmm. podcast, after we got done doing an interview and just talking to her. And uh, one of the people that was with me, you know, is from North Carolina. So they were striking up a conversation that I kind of started. And, you know, we were all joking around about different things. And, and she's great to talk to. I mean, I, you know, I haven't heard anybody ever say anything really bad about her. Yeah, me neither. You know, you know so, I mean – We'll see how this affects her going forward, because if it's not her idea, you know, does this bring about a, a level of distrust between her and, and management and creative, you know? So, you know, and it's funny because, you know, Rick says it will all be forgotten about by Survivor Series. And the thing is, he's, to me, he's probably right, because come the end of the day, the wrestling business gets treated differently. If this was some other kind of show, especially like a reality or show or something, you know, it might linger around. But there are still a lot of people. Some of them are ardent wrestling fans. A lot of them are just kind of, I'll tune in every now and then, or maybe they're not even wrestling fans at all. But they'll be like, oh, well, 
that's wrestling. That's what they do over there. That's why it's that dirty little business, you know, that, you know, some people like, but they're all a bunch of nerds and, you know, live in their mom's basement. What? And, you know, different things like that. There's a there's that stereotype that goes along with wrestling, and this just kind of feeds into that stereotype when they do a storyline like this. Yeah, yeah. And, um, again, just um, – you know, and, and maybe, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, but but to people like you and I, and and the hardcore followers of of the business that have watched Charlotte and Rick talk about, uh, you know, their their you know their Reed's passing and see how emotionally um, broken down they are about it, I think it hits them harder for a casual fan if you told them the story, but you would you didn't see you haven't seen them cry and you haven't seen that emotion, you'd think, oh, it's wrestling. But um, you know. Again, there's this other side. Like I said, I was just watching her break down on table for three uh, a couple of days ago. So, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, moving on. Uh, another newsworthy uh, part of Raw was uh, Roman Reigns and Cesaro. And you taught you you mentioned that um, great match. Uh, you know, I mean, it's got to be right up there with one of the best that Reigns has had uh, in, in his singles career right up there with the Brock match and the Daniel Bryan match from from Fastlane. Um I think that it really helped Cesaro quite a bit. I think it helped both guys. And, you know, I think this is one of those situations where in losing Cesaro was helped because he just looks so strong. I mean, you know, people talk about uh, WWE keeping Cesaro down all the time. And believe me, they, they haven't exactly given him the ball, but they really went out of their way to make him look strong in that, that matchup on Monday night. And I think he came away from it looking better. And, you know, I, I was reading, uh, some, uh, Mike Mooneyham, the, uh, the famed wrestling journalist, uh, after, after Cesaro hit the backslide for the close three and Mike Mooneyham on his uh, Facebook said, what if, what if, uh, Cesaro had scored the upset with that backslide? So that's my question to you, Brian. What if Cesaro did score that win with the backslide? And do you think that Cesaro came out positioned better um, uh, after the loss? Well, I definitely think he came out better, you know, in the loss. That's that's the weird thing is that he's looked better for a while now, and he's been losing a lot. But this was one that was a little bit different than, you know, the typical three- or four-minute match because there were, there were those little openings where going into the match, you didn't believe he was going to win. But there definitely were those glimpses of hope during the match where you really thought, you know what? What if he did win? What if, what if they feel like everybody knows what's going to happen and they want to shake it up and they've got a different idea for it? Because it's not really going to hurt Reigns necessarily. And, you know, we can go with the what the crowd wants when it comes to Cesaro. Uh, you know, it, that would have been extremely interesting, though, if Cesaro had won because – to me, I think that changes the whole dynamic of everything. Then I don't even think necessarily Gene Ambrose makes the finals. Yeah. You know, I think I think then you get a Kevin Owens Cesaro final, you know, which would get a lot of buzz, you know, online. I mean, I can sit here and talk about the audience like us. That probably makes up for what we talked about this before. Minuscule. Like 15 15 percent of the audience now or yeah. something. But still, there's a lot of other people that I think would be still very interested in that match because – you know, for the most part, they've done a good job with Kevin Owens, and I think there is something to this rising tide when it comes to support for Cesaro and things that they can still capitalize on. They they sit there and they talk about he doesn't have charisma or he doesn't have this or that, but you know what? They never give him an opportunity to talk. People are getting behind him, you know, by doing the Cesaro section, and you hear more buzz about him, you know, not only when you go to wrestling shows but obviously online. So I mean, there there's something there, and I hope that they can capitalize on this, you know, going forward. I mean. Give this guy some more opportunities. See what the crowd does, because obviously they talk about we do what the audience w- wants. And we all know that's only true to a certain extent. Yeah. And it's almost like you got to be hit over the head with a hammer before that happens in a lot of cases. But you know what? Um, that hammer is about to come out here, I think, with Cesaro. You know, what's funny. And, and I don't see this happening at all. But if you think about the prototypical authority member the, the the prototypical wrestler that the authority are looking to have as the face of the company cesaro fits it better than anybody available on the active roster right now i mean the guy is clean cut the guy is well spoken the guy is intelligent the the guy is articulate uh, the guy is is arguably uh the best wrestler quote unquote wrestler in the company um it's just ironic because i don't see them ever going down that road but yet 
if if you're going to um, if you're going to give the script to somebody that's that's not affiliated politically with the WWE and and show them the the program and say uh, pick out the next authority member, I think Cesaro fits the bill. Cesaro fits the bill. I think Roman Reigns fits the bill. I really do. Um, but I don't think they're going to do it with Reigns. I mean, to me, if you really look at the long term, you know, and I'm talking about the next six months Mm -hmm. when it comes to where they should position everybody and how they should go forward, especially with the injuries that they have. Mm -hmm. And even when Cena comes back and even when Rollins comes back, if you really want to drag it out, the best laid scenario is turning Reigns heel because then you've got this guy that when you put him in a suit, he looks fantastic and he can be this authority figure, you know, and say, I got the money, I got the power, I got the gold. It's almost like a modern day, and I, I'm not going to say they book him like Ric Flair, but it's kind of like this modern day version of Rick, you know. Just, oh, I would love to see Cesaro dropping elbows and strutting around in suits and and uh, ripping all that. Well, you clothes. can do that with Cesaro, but I think Reigns would be even uh, the. I meant Reigns. I'm sorry. Yeah, I meant yeah, yeah, Reigns. Yeah. But I mean. But you have Reigns – but I, I wouldn't have him act like Flair, but I mean from a standpoint of the moves or anything or, or wooing, of course, but – you know, and don't change his hair to blonde. But he could be kind of that guy that everybody just hates in that role because you feel like he's got it all. And guess what? He sets up a feud immediately with Ambrose. It sets up a feud immediately with Cesaro. Uh, and then, you know, he can win at the Rumble defending the title and – Brock Lesnar could come out of the Rumble, you know, win that thing. And then Reigns can be like, oh, crap, here I go. I got to face this guy again, you know. So you, you've got that. And then when Seth Rollins comes back, he's going to be a baby face, especially if Reigns is the heel. They miss a top heel right now. And the best choice that they have is sitting right in front of them with Roman Reigns. But I don't think they're going to do it. I, I don't think they're going to turn him for – a variety of reasons, one of which is the amount of merchandise that dude sells because he's number two in merch. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, they just have a plan for how they want to use him. So, OK, who's going to be the top heel then? Are you going to turn Ambrose? I don't think that's going to work as well. Cesaro would definitely be a choice. And I'd be curious about that. But I, I think I don't think the crowd would really take to that too much because I think the crowd still wants to to cheer him and get behind him. You know, and I think it would be people would still cheer for him even as a heel, but that's not the effect that you want. Right. All right. Uh, you you jumped into it. Let's talk Survivor Series and Survivor Series picks. Um, of course, the uh, the elephant in the room, Roman Reigns, whether he goes heel or not and uh, joins the authority. Uh, I'm I'm presuming uh, listening to you that you say no, that he is not turning heel at Survivor Series. Do you think he leaves with the WWE championship? I don't. I think Ambrose does, and I think he's the one that turns heel. Mm. Um, and I think they make Reigns chase the title a little bit longer. Uh, I think originally he was going to win it here. That was everybody yeah. said that was the plan. But that was chasing Seth Rollins, which has been going on for a little while. So I think, I think he's got to chase it a little bit longer. I think Ambrose is the guy that turns heel, but I, I think that's going to be awkward. You know, I'm not saying he's necessarily going to be aligned with the authority, but he could be. I, I hope they don't do that from a standpoint of trying to put Dean Ambrose in a suit. Yeah. I mean, that's that's like Aiken to putting Stone Cold in a suit back in the day. Right. Uh, I mean, Reigns, to me, answers a lot of different issues that they have right now, but I just don't think they're going to do it. Um, and I think they're they're going to pull the trigger with Ambrose. You know. Uh, what, what they're doing here with Reigns is very interesting. If you look at the bracketing of this tournament, you know, um, he wrestled Cesaro on Monday night, um, a match that got both guys over. I think that earned Reigns um, a little respect uh, from the, the wrestling community, so to speak, out there. He'll have Alberto Del Rio in the semifinals, which, you know, I, I have no reason to believe that it won't be a very good match, won't be solid. Um, and there's no mask for him to pull off. In this there's match. no mask for him to pull off in this one. And then you have Dean Ambrose and Kevin Owens. Uh, or I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Dean Ambrose, Kevin Owens. And you have uh, that winner wrestling Roman Reigns. Um, either one of those matches are going to be great. So, you know, it's one of these deals where, you know, one of the knocks against Roman is that uh, the, the hardcore audience just didn't think he was that good. They, they you know, they love their Daniel Bryans. They love their CM Punks. Um, they love their Kevin Owens, their Dolph Ziggler's, but they don't see Roman Reigns or John Cena. Although I think that's changed a little bit with Cena as that wrestler that they like. But I think that the, uh, the company has really positioned him 
to um to change that narrative with his path to the the uh, WWE title. I think a lot more people have been won over by Reigns, and it's because of the work that he's done in the ring. Maybe that's why that they even did the brackets the way that they did. You know, you go back to WrestleMania, like you said, he had a really really good match with Brock Lesnar. Yeah. And yeah. uh, go back to even just a month ago, the Hell in a Cell match yeah, with Bray Wyatt. I thought that won a lot of people over too because True. that was one of those we're going to go out there and we're going to beat the crap out of one another. And yeah. they had a really good match. And I think people really appreciate that going, you know what? He might be the pretty boy and they've got a certain idea what they want to use for him. But when he needs to go out there and get his hands dirty, mm-hmm. he will do it. And, you know, the match yeah, with Cesaro was very good as well. So I think that's I think that's how WWE is trying to get the audience behind him saying, you know what? There's going to be a certain pocket that's just not going to like this guy anyway. They're just not going to. So let's try to win everybody over by showing that he's really, really good in the ring. I mean, I still think that one of the problems that they have with Roman that they even, uh, you know, got in their way a little bit on Monday was these long promos. You know, you've Mm -hmm. got to keep his promos to two, three, four minutes. These longer promos, they're going to kill the guy because I think he's charismatic. I think he can talk. I think he's horrible at reciting scripts. He's horrible. He's horrible. You know, what was great about him in the shield um, were those brief, the, you know, the brief verbiage, which was more of a snarl than uh, than, than yeah. him talking. And, and they're really missing that. It's like with Charlotte. I think Charlotte is really good. I think she could cut a promo, but it's got to be shorter. But when she has to recite a script, I don't think she's very good at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a tough deal. Um you know, I don't want to belabor the entire Survivor Series card because, quite honestly, uh, you know, we don't know it, what the entire card is because they won't tell us. We don't know what the entire card is, um, <laughs> and there are, there are more important things to talk about. But um, real quickly, anything you see coming out of Undertaker and Kane against the Wyatts? Um, you see anything being set up with Undertaker and Strowman, or you think it's just going to be uh, a squash? Uh, what, what do you see here? You know, I I'd love to see them do more with Bray Wyatt, but. With the way that they've done this entire feud so far, I don't want to see any more between these yeah. two factions. I really don't. Um, I'm afraid of Taker against Strowman at WrestleMania, which yeah. I think would be a huge mistake. Uh, I, I don't want to see that. You know what? I have a lot of respect for both Kane and Taker for everything that they've done. Mm-hmm. But when they came out on Raw on Monday night and they're doing the whole white show and everything and they're making their way to the ring, mm-hmm. I couldn't get the thought out of their mind of like, these dudes are just old. Yeah. They look old. They didn't look fit. That doesn't mean they're not good wrestlers, but I mean, you, you always think about, you know, Kane's this big muscular monster and Taker's this bigger than life character. And when they came out there and Taker, for whatever reason, didn't even have his coat and hat on. Yeah. But they just looked like a couple of middle aged older guys. And they looked like guys that would fit that age. You yeah. know? They're between 40 and 50 years old. You know, they're not going to be, you know, they're, they're muscular, but they, they got a little bit of extra weight on them. You know, they're moving a little bit slower. They're looking a little bit older in the face. I mean, they, they look like normal guys and they don't look like this bigger than life characters that they were made out to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agreed. Agreed a hundred percent. And, and my pick, uh, I do think Reigns winds up winning the uh, title at, at Survivor Series. And I do think that, that he goes heel for a lot of the reasons that you... Uh-huh. I hope you're right, man. Mentioned earlier. Yes, yes. It happens every once in a while. I like it. You're keeping the faith, man. You stand positive. I am trying. I am trying. It is all positivity. I mean, it, you know, it's the holiday season. If you can't say positive now, when can you be positive? You're, that's the power of positivity. I'm glad you're enforcing it. PSA, as Bob Backlund would say uh, after every email. PSA, positive something something. Uh, <laughs> PA, P- PMA, I'm sorry. Positive mental attitude. Positive mental attitude, sure. Positive mental attitude, yes. Uh, let's talk a little uh, WrestleMania 32. You talked a little bit about it when you were um, analyzing Roman Reigns and, and where he goes from here. Um, there was a report in the Wrestling Observer that the main event, penciled in anyway at least, was Roman Reigns against John Cena. Um, a match uh, I predicted on the Camel Clutch blog, but uh, all of a sudden now has legs. Um, another report came out that said The Rock, as of now, uh, cannot wrestle due to an insurance liability issue. However, there was a caveat in there is that if he could clear it up, um, maybe he does wrestle. Ronda Rousey, obviously out. She's not going to be on the show. 
you know, what do you think? Do you think that we're going to see Brock in the ring? Do you see? Oh, and another report, Brian, um, was that Seth Rollins wasn't even figured into any of the main matches, which uh, kind of goes against uh, previous reports that I read that he was penciled in against Triple H. So, I mean, in your uh, between the ropes crystal ball, uh, what do you see here? And what do you think about Reigns and Cena. Um, let me just say this about Reigns and Cena. One thing that I have noticed over the years is that when the WWE, uh, when Vince McMahon has a WrestleMania main event in his mind, um, and and it's in his mind in November, it winds up staying in his mind in April. You know, when you hear rumors of these matches, and sometimes people say, "Oh no, that can never happen." They always wind up happening. Um, so I, I do think that happens. Um, what do you think? What's well, something I hadn't really even thought about too much before, but I guess it makes sense. Um, you know, maybe they just don't like the idea of doing back-to-back years of Reigns against Lesnar. Mm-hmm. So, but the only reason that I really believed in that match because I was looking at okay, who would match up with Lesnar then? Yeah. Where would they? Where would they take him? Because okay, the world title match that's going to be one of the biggest matches. If you get The Rock, that's going to be a huge match. And then uh, if you have Lesnar in another match. To me, that's your top three matches. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about Seth Rollins, okay, he wasn't factored into one of those top matches. But that still could have been Triple H because, you know, I mean, that's still going to be a match I think people would like to see. But it's not going to be billed as one of the top three matches on the show. Um, It could have been The Undertaker, quite honestly, because Undertaker is an attraction, but it's not going to be as big as it once was because the streak is dead. Yeah. So maybe that was where they were going to go was Rollins against Taker. And now that's out the door. So I, I mean, from their logic, I can understand Reigns and Cena, especially if Reigns goes into this, that match as the champion and he's still a baby face. Um, because then they'll be like, we'll get that organic audience, you know, where they're going to pick their favorites. Do they want Cena? Do they want Reigns? And there's enough people that don't like Cena anyway that they'll root for anybody else. That means they'll have to go for Roman. And this will kind of be the, you know, passing the baton kind of moment, I guess, you know, from Cena's, you know, still going to be obviously a big part of the company, but he's handing over the top spot to Reigns, mm-hmm. you know, in their mind. So, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. I just I just don't know where all of the other parts fit. I mean, where do you put Lesnar? Where do you put – if you can get The Rock to wrestle, where do you put Rock? I mean, I guess Rock against Triple H would still make a lot of sense if they can make that match happen because right now Triple H doesn't have a dance partner either because of – the situation with Rock and also with Rollins being on the shelf. Yeah, and I don't I don't necessarily discount Rollins being out of WrestleMania. They said six to nine months, and every once in a while they skew those numbers um, to uh, to to cover up any surprise returns. Um, I haven't heard that he would be back, but I, I don't think it's you know I, I wouldn't completely write him off yet. And with the Brock thing, what's really interesting about that, Brian, is that. They had this match with Brock and Undertaker scheduled, penciled in for WrestleMania. Then all of a sudden, Vince McMahon reportedly had this new idea. And in order to put Brock in that new match at Mania, he expedited the series with Undertaker at Hell in a Cell and at SummerSlam, having to pay under having to pay Brock Lesnar a lot more money for those extra dates that he didn't originally have them for. So it's quite an investment right there. So he obviously must have some grand idea. That is so worthwhile. He was willing to make the investment to bring Brock in for some extra dates uh, in the fall. But who that is, it's it's really anybody's guess at this point. Yeah, I have no idea. And the, the funny thing is, so Brock got this new deal earlier in the year, obviously, to remain mm. with WWE. He's redone that deal twice now. Mm. Twice. Mm. He's redone that deal to get more dates at it. Yeah. Because he's doing some house shows in January. Yeah. As well. So, it's it, you know, they want to use him more. Brock's like, fine, if you want to pay through the nose, I'll be there. Yeah. But as I sit here right now, I have no earthly idea who they would put Brock Lesnar against. Mm. Um, because you can't tell me that they're planning on Daniel Bryan because we still don't know what the health is of, of Daniel. And even if he was healthy enough, would they really want to put Daniel Bryan in there with all the nervousness that they already have right. against the most physical guy in the company? I mean, I'd love to see that match. I don't think they would necessarily. Uh, would a Brock Lesnar, Kevin Owens match at that point sell and something that they would look at? What about a Dean Ambrose match? Maybe. I I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wrapping up uh, with a couple of uh, quick topics. 
topics here. So uh, my old ECW colleague Taz has made some news because uh, according to the Tasmaniac, he believes that the Ronda Rousey Holly Holm UFC fight was a fix. Now, I don't really want to get into too much UFC because I think it's a, a different audience. But, um, you know, in my opinion, he can't be that stupid. He's a guy that has, uh, you know, a, a somewhat of a, a little bit of a mixed martial arts background. He's very knowledgeable of mixed martial arts. He can't be that stupid. And, you know, I mean, as far as a fix, um, it's just it's, it's impossible. You know, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Say, you know, we're going to kick you in the side of the head. Make sure that that you you don't wake up. We're going to batter your face to the point that you're going to need plastic surgery on your lips. I mean, it's just impossible. It's not like she got cold cocked. It's not like we're talking about a, a GSP, Matt Sarah uh, upset. Um, do you think that he's he's um, that this is calculated and he's just looking to get some news? Or do you think he, he really feels this way and he's lost his mind? Well, and you know this, too, being around wrestlers. How many times have you had a conversation with them and you try to talk about mainstream sports? And Dozens. Lot, and, and wrestlers say, oh, man, what a work that was. Dozens. That, what a work that was. Uh, we yes. know that the refs were in on the on the fix on that game because they wanted to extend the playoff series, you know, to another round. Or, oh, they did this because they're going to have a rematch later in the year. I mean, which is one of the most c- conversations that drives me insane when I yeah. talk to some of these guys to where I just don't talk sports with any wrestlers that I know for the most part yeah. if they're going to have that mentality. I was really disappointed in Taz and doing that. I mean, I get it. There's a lot of people that still have the mentality and somewhat right in that they want to get people talking. They want to do something that's going to push buttons and, you know, get more people interested, you know, and sometimes it will get people more interested in talking about that subject Would that translate into more people actually, you know, listening to your show more. That remains to be seen. But either way, to me, it was disappointing from the standpoint that you are saying this just to get a spotlight on yourself and it's kind of a desperate ploy or you're doing it because you do believe it. And like you said, it's asinine to think that way for a variety of reasons. And his whole argument to me was bad because he sits there and talks about, well, they knew she was going to be gone until July. So it means no one was going to have the belt for, or no one was going to defend the belt for the next, you know, seven months. How many times have we seen this in UFC where somebody hasn't defended the belt for a period of time that's five, six, seven months? I think Cain Velasquez went like two years before he defended the belt. Right. And you can make the argument, too, well, then they create an interim title. That's still an interim title. Right. You know, whether you want to put it on the same level. But, I mean, I've seen plenty of times where somebody has been injured in training and they, you know, so they didn't create an interim title, but – nobody defended that title for seven, eight, nine months, or even where somebody said, I'm going to take a break because I just had three fights in a row over the last 18 months. So now I'm going to take six months off. That happens. And on top of that, why would Ronda Rousey ever agree to take a fall, you know, and to lose that hurts her brand. I mean, UFC consider and say, well, the rematch is going to be the biggest rematch ever. That show UFC 200 was already going to be the biggest show that they've ever had, you know, whether she was defending the title or whether she was going for the title. So um, maybe it'll be bigger now, but I don't think it's going to be that much different. She's been their top star and now she's been blemished and it, it hurts UFC from a business standpoint a little bit, I think, but it definitely hurts the Ronda Rousey brand because now she's not this unbeatable person. You know what? The aura, the aura is gone, right? She, you can withstand one loss as long as you come back immediately and you win it back in the role that she's been in. But if she does not win the championship back, or if she wins it like on some kind of a, a weird fluky finish, then it doesn't restore her aura and it, it just it damages her brand because, I mean, why do you think she's gotten all these different opportunities, whether it's been a magazine covers or she's in movies or whatever things that she's done? My, my wife knows her just from watching her on Ellen. My wife doesn't watch right. her. She knows her from watching exactly. her on Ellen. By the way, these people that hate Ronda Rousey going, oh, she's got an attitude and she's this and she's that. And like, I don't know if she does or not, but I don't really care if she does because she's in that position. She's obviously worked hard and she's earned the things that she's gotten. Was she supposed to do? Turn down these opportunities. Yeah. And I think I think she's done some great things as well when it comes to being a positive role model for women, but also for kids. I mean, yeah. she's done. 
I think I think for the most part she has. I mean, there's some things I know that people get all you know uppity about, but I don't understand why there has been so much hatred for Ronda Rousey and people are like. There's some people that are so happy that that she lost now. I mean, I just I think it's. I think it's a bit of the arrogance. I think yeah. people see her, you know, when she wouldn't shake hands with Holly Holm. I mean, she wouldn't shake hands after the fight with Misha Tate, but Misha Tate is different than Holly Holm. You know, Holly Holm right. uh, is is from. But, but don't you think it's a little bit different too if it was a guy? From a guy, we're like, oh man, you know, how about that? You know, they don't shake hands because they know this is a business, and you know, they don't have to like each other and everything like that. But I think it could be a little bit of a difference when it comes to women going, oh, why is she being so catty? She's a lot like Brock Lesnar, in my opinion, in the UFC. Great. In that, yeah, in that Brock would give the finger and Brock wouldn't shake hands. And the MMA crowds hated him for a I while, but they certainly wanted to buy his fights and, and watch him with the hopes that he would, he would get beat. And he was the biggest draw that they had. I, I don't know what Ronda's numbers are, but I'm assuming that Ronda's probably out, outdrawn him just from the sheer number of fights she's had compared to – his uh, career span, but sure. um, it's it's a lot like Brock Lesnar in that you know they love to hate him. Um, I don't think she's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, yeah. But at the same time, I think you know I think she's earned what she's gotten. I don't think she's yes. I don't think she's evil. She's not perfect, but she's not evil. And going back to the whole thing about you know with with Taz and, and everything. Okay, she loses this one. You know, she's got to win the next one because guess what? You lose twice, you're not going to be the person that people call when it comes to we've got this role in this big movie and you're the top women's draw. That That is going to be gone. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's still there now. The one loss isn't going to cripple her. She's still dead. She, the movies that she's got planned, she's still going to be doing them. But another one, and that destroys her aura and it puts a huge dent, you know, in her brand. You know, I mean, People bring up Gina Carano, and Gina was a great fighter. You know, uh, she's great for her, the time that she was out there. I think she's become a really good actor. But you don't yeah. see Gina Carano getting, you know, the no. same kind of roles that Ronda Rousey is because Ronda is the woman right now. Yeah, I mean, like I said, my wife knows her from Ellen. I'm in the drugstore picking up a prescription. I see her at the counter on the cover of like uh, some women's magazine or something. I mean, it's just, but you know. On top of that, so again, not going down too much uh, UFC here, but but wrapping up the UFC talk, um, you have your loss to Holly Holm, then they rematch. So let's say they rematch, and she loses again to Holly Holm. So then what's next for Ronda Rousey at that point? So the the logical trajectory in my mind is a fight with Cyborg, because by that point, Cyborg has had plenty of time to cut weight, and Cyborg uh, and Ronda, I mean, that's it at that point. If she, if she loses again – you know, the money's gone. At least at that point, you could still salvage uh, that rivalry. And there's um, there's a pretty good possibility that Cyborg beats her as well. So then you're talking 0-3 at that point. Um, and at that rate, I, I kind of think she retires. Yeah, and, that, and that's when I think people would question, like, was she just a fluke? And yeah. was, you know, the question the, the opponents that she had. You know what the funny thing about Cyborg is? So Cyborg, you know, was very happy. To see Ronda yeah. lose, which is um, stupid, which right. makes no sense to me. To me, it's just like that was a huge paycheck that just got flushed down the toilet. Yeah, you know, right there because you want her beaten, being unbeaten, and you want to be the person that has the opportunity to hand her, you know, her first loss. She'll never be, a, she'll never be the first, uh, the first one to beat her anymore. Right, it's not yeah. going to mean as much. That's why it means so much right now for Holly Holm. Well, I mean, I don't think anybody would accuse Cyborg of being a smart businesswoman when you look at the, uh, you know, her career choices that she's made over the last uh, couple of years. There, there's a lot of different uh, choices she's made that have been um, questionable, questionable to say the least, you know. And she's still got to be able to cut weight. I mean, to get yeah. to that fight. I mean, she's. I guess the talk is now that she's got a nutritionist and she's working on it and she's really serious about it. But it's like, where was this, you know, three years ago? Exactly, and she's got to do it hypothetically for the next year and a half, two years, because, you know, it's easy. It's not easy, but it's easier for her to cut weight knowing, okay, I'm going to fight Ronda in July of next, uh, of uh, next year. But now Ronda's going to fight in July of that year. She might not fight again for another six or seven months at that point. So, you know, Cyborg has to maintain that, that nutrition for, for that amount of time. I mean, it's, it's a different ball game at this rate. Yeah. And plus she's older, you know, yeah. like I said, if she had done it three or four yes. years ago, you would think it'd be easier, but as you get older, it's tougher to keep that weight off. Don't I know it. 
finally, finally, Brian, as I always say, we'll only be about 20 or 30 minutes, and we're about 40 minutes into this thing. Mm. Finally, uh, the great Nick Bockwinkle passed away uh, this week. Um, I have some thoughts. I have some experiences with Nick. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, you ever interviewed Nick and, and just your memories of watching Nick? Thoughts on Nick? I never got to interview Nick. I met him very, very briefly one time at a convention where before anybody was doing autograph signings, he was actually um, at a booth next to me having breakfast. And once he was done eating, I introduced myself to him and I actually got a picture which turned out to be blurry and I uh, didn't keep it. But ah. it was a <laughs> it was a picture with Nick and with Pat Patterson. Oh, interesting. It would have been fantastic if uh, the person that took the picture knew what they were doing. Um, but, you know, he's such a gentleman. I mean, I, you never hear anybody say anything bad about Nick. You know, to me, he was a champion's champion and that he knew how to, you know, handle that role of being a champion. Um I think that he, when you talk about professional wrestling, that he was the ultimate professional when it came to how he handled the business, how he did his business, um, you know, and, you know, he, he was just one of these all around great guys um, that that loved the business and loved his role in it and uh, knew how to handle himself, knew how to, you know, knew how to do things the right way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I interviewed Nick um, for a shoot interview. I actually uh, sat down with him for about three hours. Uh, for a shoot interview, gosh, I want to say about three or four years ago. Um, it may have, have even been longer. And he was awesome. Um, not only was he nice and gentlemanly and and and, and articulate, but he was just he he was just very he he had so many great stories. And what I thought was fascinating, and I said this to him when we were talking, both on and off camera. I said what's fascinating is you know Nick grew up around the business. His dad was in the business, Warren Bachwinkel. Yeah. And Nick was kind of one of those um, the, those last ones that had a lineage to that era in that Nick could talk about all these stories of all these old time wrestlers that nobody had any experience talking about. You know, these guys that were hanging around with with uh, Nick when he was a kid with his dad. You know, Nick had stories about these guys that nobody alive at this point has as many stories on, on the guys from that era as Nick did. Um and while some people probably watched that shoot interview and might have been a little disappointed because I, I, I kind of focused in on that area, um, I thought it was fascinating just listening to these stories about these guys that you've read about and heard about, but nobody – you know, nobody alive has had any experiences with them. I mean, talking about the ribs from that era, um, I just thought he was great. Um, but as, as a fan – um, I mean, I read about him in magazines when I was younger. I started watching wrestling in 82. So he was larger than life in the after mags, the quote unquote after mags. Um, and, uh, I, you know, and, and then as I got older, I watched more of Nick on tape and, and he was on ESPN when, when uh, AWA went on ESPN and I loved him as a promo. Um, I put him up there as like maybe like top five of all time. I mean, I look at his AWA promos and they're just awesome, especially the ones in Memphis during his feud with Jerry Lawler. I mean, just like, just brilliant stuff and um i think if there's any shame it's that when the wwf expanded um you know in 84 and 85 that nick wasn't you know uh five or seven five to seven years younger and couldn't have been a part of that because i think he would have um been great as one of those transitional guys like a terry funk and a harley race and, and helping these younger guys and and feuding with hogan on on uh on a big scale like that i think he would have been awesome i think he got hit a lot he got a lot of great matches out of hogan um and, and um i just uh yeah i think that it's uh it's a shame he um uh, wasn't able to uh be a part of that era just so more people could see him and, and experience yeah how great what's he was. weird that we never saw him you know in that company and we never even saw him have a bigger role when it came to the nwa but that, yeah that was by his choice though because he just didn't want to be a guy that was on the road 300 days a year he's I mean, a family guy he liked going home he liked his family and his friends and he was a businessman and he you know he did well in the territory and he he got along well with Vern. and yeah he um he, yeah he would sit there and go why you know why would i make you know x amount of money being on the road 300 days a year when maybe i make half of that but I'm not on the road all the time. I get to, you know, I'm not stuck in a car all week long. I'm not wrestling every night or every, you know, or, you know, some, six or seven times a week. And, you know, I can sit here and I can go home, you know, with my family every night and I can sleep in my own bed and I can still make good money. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, well, that's uh, that's going to wrap it up here. A lot uh, going on uh, this week in wrestling. Brian, uh, looks like I'll be uh, joining you and your podcast next week, and uh, we'll talk uh, all the fallout of Survivor Series, see who was right or wrong on their uh, predictions regarding the championship and Roman Reigns. Um, so why don't you take a moment and uh, give yourself uh, as many plugs as you want as to where uh, the good people listening to this podcast today can uh, read and listen to you. Sure. Well, everybody can just go to betweentheropes.com. You can find the different podcasts there and also on SoundCloud and on iTunes. And you can uh, follow me on Twitter. It's uh, at Brian Fritz. And you can uh, check out our Facebook page as well if you'd like. Just go to uh, facebook.com backslash between the ropes. Awesome. Well, Brian, it's always been an, uh, always a good time. And uh, again, we always uh, try and keep these things short, but yet we just start talking and, and they wind up uh, hitting the time limit draw, hitting curfew, as they would say, yeah. the old uh, MSG shows. But no, thanks a lot for uh, joining me here today, and uh, I look forward to uh, coming over to your house next week. You got it, man. Thanks. And I think that wrestling is better when they do that, but I think it has to deal with that person – Right there. I don't, I don't like it too much when it delves too much into family like kids or especially yeah. when it comes to somebody that's already passed. You know, um, that's why even like go back to the storyline they did, uh, you know, 10 years ago with Rey Mysterio um, and Eddie Guerrero yes. after Eddie had passed away. That was very uncomfortable. So that was one of the problems I had with it was they were bringing up this storyline of, you know, read passing. And I just thought it was unnecessary. I thought it was something that was done very cheap and salacious and done just to try to get people talking and not for the right reasons. It didn't get the right kind of heat. Plus on top of that, if you look at the state of WWE right now and they'll sit there and they'll say, this is sports entertainment. It's not anything that's different from a drama or a soap opera that's out there. But at the same time, they're trying to promote family friendly product and PG rated content. And it totally goes against that. What was really strange, too, is on a night where WWE showed a lot of class with the moment of silence to open yes. up the show for the you know victims in Paris. And then later on, while they didn't show the video package for the passing of Bob Backlund, the announcers did talk about it. Uh, Bob so, Backlund. Whoa. I mean, not, excuse me, uh, Nick Bockwinkle. <laughs> excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry about that, uh, Mr. Backlund. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they talk about the passing and, you know, what a great gentleman, a great champion he was. And then they close the show with a, a very edgy, controversial angle like this. It just seems so out of place. Yeah. You know, um, I don't want to be a hypocrite because I've gone on your podcast. And when you and I had a real lengthy discussion about what needs to change when, when they had low ratings, um, my point of view was that they needed more edginess. They need to be more edgy, kind of like the Attitude Era. But now take was, you know what? Um, it, not only was it just not a good angle, I didn't think it was a very productive angle in, in selling the match, but I wasn't offended by it. But now we're talking two days later and Ric Flair went on his podcast and he said he was never notified about it. Uh, he was very hesitant to come out outright and criticize it. But uh, the way that he described it on his podcast, he said that Charlotte's in a position where she's afraid to say no. Um, and uh, he cried. Rick cried. Nobody told him about it. Nobody even called him afterwards to check on him and to see if it was OK. And then on top of that, making matters even even uh, worse or just unraveling this mystery even more. There is a report uh, from Brandon Stroud on Uproxx that says that Charlotte was the one that pitched the idea to the writer. So a couple of different elements here, Brian, I'd like to to get your thoughts on one. Um, Rick is saying on his podcast uh, that nobody's contacted him uh, before or after. Number two, he's on his podcast saying that Charlotte couldn't say no. So either one of two things is happening. Either Uprox has it wrong or Charlotte had this idea and she hasn't even contacted him yet to talk about it. And just your thoughts on the angle itself. Well, it's funny because I saw that thing from Brandon and then I know Mike Johnson at PW Insider has refuted that and it said, no, it wasn't Charlotte's idea. It was one that got pitched to her and she had said, OK, I'll do it. But, you know. Like you mentioned and Rick had said on his podcast, it was something that she just can't refuse right now considering her position in the company. Right. Uh, when I saw the angle, I was very, very uncomfortable. And I'm okay with some edgy storylines. and Not quite. Um, and this certainly was edgy. And – I don't mind edgy, um, especially in the PG-13, in the PG era. I, I think it's um, welcomed. I just, you know, I look at the angle and I watch the angle just like everybody else did. And 
I just didn't see the purpose. If you could, if you, meaning a WWE writer, uh, somebody in charge of creative, could pitch me why they needed to do that and what the objective was, then maybe I would understand it better. But, you know, for starters, for the casual audience watching at home, and I mean casual audience such as like, you know, kids. I mean, my nieces watch watch Raw and they're, they're kids. Um, that's the, the casual audience at home. They know nothing about Reed Flair. Now, sure, they'll go on Google the next day or Wikipedia or whatever, but they know nothing about Reed Flair. So I don't really understand where they were going. And I think that if it was their idea, um, it's a really uh, it's 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 really uh, it's almost sick because, you know, you watch Rick and Charlotte talk about Reed and they're obviously still in a lot of pain. I was watching. I don't know if you saw the table for three recently that it had Charlotte and Tamina and Natalia on there. And uh, Reed came up and Charlotte broke down. And, and quite honestly, I don't think she recovered throughout the entire table for three. She lost her place on Monday when she was talking about it. So obviously this girl is dealing with a lot of pain um, right now. And it almost, Brian, and, and and I'm curious for your thoughts on this. You know, Charlotte said something during that promo where she said the only reason she's there is for Reed. And, you know, I mean, I might be reading way too much into this and going on the idea that it wasn't her. Welcome to another edition of the Camel Clutch Blog Extra, where we take a look at the hot topics this week in professional wrestling and as always i am joined by my favorite co-host he is the host himself of between the ropes and a writer for fox sports and sportingnews.com respectively brian fritz brian welcome back i'm just glad that i'm now the favorite i like that tag well you know it was either you or nobody else but okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know but you're still the favorite a lot of competition out there. A lot of competition out there. A lot of competition out there. But uh, but no, I mean, you and I have been doing this uh, since the late 90s and always a, a good time sitting down and talking with you. Um, but yes, yeah, so Brian, it is a big week. It is uh, Survivor Series week, but a, a story that has evolved uh, into a much bigger story is this whole WWE Divas contract signing angle that went down on Monday Night Raw with Charlotte and Paige. Now, originally, when I wrote a blog about this uh, Tuesday, the morning after, um, I wasn't offended by it. Uh, a lot of people were. A lot of people called it tasteless. A lot of people called it disgusting. A lot of people were offended. I wasn't offended by it because at the time, I made a lot of presumptions. And my presumption was, if it's okay with Charlotte and it's okay with the rest of the Flair family, then it's okay – by me, because who am I to get offended over something like that? And everybody deals with grief differently. Um, I've I've also lost a brother in recent years, so I certainly have a lot of empathy and sympathy for what Charlotte is going through. And people deal with uh, grief differently. So my original idea, it's almost as if if she's saying, um, I'm only doing this because, you know, for Reed, I'm not doing this for for anybody else. And um, almost like like giving the finger, uh, you know, to the company. But I just don't even see what the objective was, Brian, and in, in, in what's it going to sell? Yeah, that's the whole thing, too. You know, you're sitting going, does this going to does this make you more interested in getting Survivor Series? Right. Does this make you more interested in the match that they have? And to me, no. Um <laughs> you know, I know WWE might even go as far as, well, we keep talking about this Divas revolution and you want more women. So what are you complaining about? Because we gave them an edgy storyline. People said they want more edgy content. We're giving you more of the women. We put them in the main event slot. But I I think there needs to be an addendum that goes with that from a standpoint of you can be edgy, but there needs to be a better purpose to it. And there's a difference between going over the line and jumping over the line and the other thing is, too, when it comes to the women, that's great. You want to do more with them. But, like, this came out of nowhere. I mean, they yeah. didn't even promote that this was in the main event slot. It's just they just kept promoting the contract signing was coming up. And as the show went on, you kept waiting for it. And then out of nowhere, it's it's 1045 on the East Coast. And they're coming back from break. And you're like, oh, wait, the contract signing is actually in the final segment of the show. Yeah. You know, which was really strange because you would think, like, that's where they're going to put the match be with Roman Reigns and Cesaro. But that was that was long gone. Yeah. And the only thing that was weird about that, I mean, I was watching that match and it kind of hit me going, 
Okay, are they doing the Del Rio Kalisto match on SmackDown? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. I was kind of thinking the same thing. I was like, what's going on here, man? They still got that match to go. Yeah. And um, I guess they were just focused.